So most days I hate my job. I should say, though, I have two jobs. I'm fond of one of them and the other one, not so much. One job which I'm fond of is that I have the privilege of working with churches here in the Midwest where I get to help coach and train congregations and leadership teams and pastors who are, who are asking questions like, how do we re-engage our neighborhood with the gospel? How do we cultivate kingdom presence in our community? And I get to be a part of uh, helping come alongside and ask questions and train and coach and that sort of thing. That part is really exciting. I'm helping to start this as a fairly new initiative, and so that does not pay the bills. And uh, Coffee, sorry, Dr. Washington, uh, he, uh, he made mention that uh, my wife is back there, and we have two and a half kids, and so I can't really have a job that doesn't pay the bills. And so I've got to find a job where, I've got, where I can pay the bills. So I got a job uh, working in retail to help pay the bills. Has anybody ever worked in retail before? Okay. So working in retail is hard. Um, and, and, it's, and the hours are tough because I work really late and then really early and there's no set schedule. I had to request this day off like months ago just to make sure that I could be here with you. So I'm not home with my kids at night. You know, like we don't have family dinners very often. I'm missing their school programs and parent-teacher conferences and that sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit tough, but I think the part that's really hard for me is that working in retail kind of makes you feel like a nobody, or at least people treat you like you're a nobody, right? You put that uniform shirt on, and you walk out onto the sales floor, and all of a sudden, it's like you have this magnet for everyone's anger and their frustration, and all the ugliness of the world is just like coming right at you. I'm not going to tell you where I work, because the stories I'm telling here, I want to keep my job, because still got to pay those bills. But it's tough. It's tough. I have customers yell at me every day. And they get cussed out once a week, you know, insulted once a week. It's just, it's not very much fun to sit there and just take it and take it and take it. If you've worked in retail or the service industry, maybe you could tell similar stories to that. It's not a very glamorous job either. I mean, I work at the mall, right? I've got to navigate the food court on my way there. I've got to avoid that pushy kiosk guy that's trying to get you to take the lotion or the girl that wants you to sit down so she can style your hair. You laugh, but guys, 10 years later, this, just drink it in. This is where it's going to be. <laughs> I clock in and I clock out. I do the same thing every day. Most days I think this is getting old. It's not a very epic job. It's not a very big story. It's very obscure way to make a living. So now add to that, that as a follower of Jesus, I want my life to make a dynamic kingdom impact. Right? I want to see God's kingdom come in the world and take root in the places where I live and the people that I live among. I want to see his peace and wholeness and justice and righteousness come to bear in the world, and so you might see where I could think, boy, doing this every day seems like just this faint little whisper compared to the possibilities out there for me to leave my kingdom mark on the world. So it's been really hard for me working in that, in that context, but I think to get at why, I need to back up and tell the story because it was 10 years ago where I was sitting in these chairs right where you are. Actually, not these chairs. They were orange, weren't they? And ugly and not comfortable at all. But we got these, and these were a great upgrade. But I was sitting right here in this room dreaming about what kind of story my life would be, the kind of impact that I would make in the world. And while I was sitting here, I had no idea where life would take me. I had no idea where God would lead me. I just knew that that story was going to be big. I just knew it was going to be a really big story. And after I left here, I got the chance to uh, become a pastor of a little church in Brooklyn, New York, in the middle of one of the most densely populated immigrant neighborhoods in the country. And if you went on the New York Spring Break mission trip or have gone on it any of the past four years, you were at my church. 
one of the biggest, most important cities in the world, at 25, I got hired to be senior pastor of a small, basically dying congregation, but where there was incredible potential to do amazing kingdom work. And we did. The reality is we did. Like I said, it was an immigrant neighborhood, and we began to hear stories of our friends and our neighbors and people in our congregation who were experiencing incredible pain because of injustice happening right in our neighborhood. The U.S. immigration system is incredibly complex, and if you don't understand our culture and our language, let alone that system, you might imagine where that's a fairly difficult thing, that's a fairly difficult thing to navigate. And so these families who were doing absolutely nothing wrong were getting taken advantage of by these so-called lawyers who would take all of their money and then never process anything. And so in addition to being taken for all they were worth, families were literally being broken up right in our neighborhood. And we thought, what better way to establish kingdom presence than for the church to say, that's not right, we're going to do something about it. And so we formed a, a nonprofit legal center that was government recognized. And this little church of about 75 people, we started practicing immigration law in the front foyer of our church. Because we knew we could do it credibly, we knew we could do it affordably, and we knew that we were doing it not because we were trying to get rich, but because we cared about the people who were actually our neighbors. Right? For me, this was it. This is how we were going to leave our mark. This was the story I knew I was meant to live. We were the first local church in the country to do it. And people started to notice. My denomination asked me to uh, speak at the denominational conference, and it was, on a, it was on justice and compassion. And so they had heard what we were doing, and they asked me to be one of the keynote speakers there were two speakers that day of the conference. Uh, it was myself and Ron Sider. And if you know, uh, don't know that name, uh, in issues of um, uh, justice and compassion over the last 50 or so years, Ron Sider is kind of like an evangelical grandfather in that world. He's, he's, he's incredibly wise, and it was, a really interesting, it was really cool that he was going to be there, but he was speaking right before me. And I thought, all right, Ron Sider's open for me. Trinity heard about what we were doing. The president had gotten in touch with me and said, hey, can we do a story for you for the Trinity magazine? Sure, that sounds great. So I did some interviews over the phone, and they sent a photographer out, and the photographer had done advertising campaigns for Rolex with Eli Manning, and he was telling me all these stories as he was coming to take my picture. And as we're taking these photos with all different kinds of groups of people around, uh, around our church, um, they kept talking about, the photographer and his assistant kept talking about, oh, we still need to get the hero shot. We still need to get the hero shot. I'm like, I, I have no idea what that means, but I'm just smiling because my face hurts. I had fun once on my wedding day. Smiling because my face hurts. So here we are, and, and we're taking all these pictures all over the place, and they're talking about needing to get this picture, and then I realized what they mean. The hero shot was a picture of the me. Right? This sort of dramatic, sort of epic picture of me. And I realized, holy cow, I'm the hero. Holy cow, I'm the hero. Holy cow, I'm the hero. This was it. I'd done it. Right? In less than 10 years, I had gone from a student sitting right where you were with big dreams about leaving a kingdom mark, and now I'm posing for a hero shot. I did it. I had my epic story. I was writing a great kingdom tale with my life. So you might guess that going from posing for hero shots to having people cuss you out on the sales floor is an adjustment. It's a shock to the system. You see, I chose to leave Brooklyn because I believed that we were following God into the next chapter of the epic story. Take this job now, I'm just going to make ends meet, but sooner or later, there's an epic story that's going to take place. Well, guess what? That was a year ago, and Monday morning, I called. Listen, 
this last year has been a struggle, and I'm realizing why. I'm realizing that the last year has been a daily confrontation with one of my greatest fears, that my life would be ordinary, that my life would be normal. I have ordinaryphobia. I don't know if you're like me, though. I don't know if anything in that story resonates with you. I don't know if you're sitting here like me, dreaming about the dream, you know, dreaming dreams about what your life will be like and the kind of story that your life will be. I don't know if as a Christian you sit here thinking about how you're going to leave your mark for Jesus in the world. But, but if the answer is yes, and if, if you are like me, then would, would you share that in the comments? Then, then I think that we need to pause, right? Because I think it's into that drive that, that maybe we should go to leave our kingdom mark on the world that I think God invites us into a different kind of life. That in a world full of people striving for the hero shot as the antidote to an ordinary life, that God might be inviting us to see that it's precisely in the ordinary mess of life that his kingdom takes root and flourishes. So as I've reflected on scripture, I think about things like how God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. I mean, yes, that bush was on fire, but before God showed up, it was a bush, right? Or like when he reveals himself to Elijah, he's not, he's not in the powerful wind or the rattling earthquake or the raging fire. He's in that still small whisper. That's a powerful image for me. When Jesus engages people, he does it at like watering holes and in people's living rooms. Right? When God chooses people, when Jesus would choose people for his purposes, he's not looking for the hero. He's looking for ordinary fishermen and government employees. If you find a few with nothing to do today, you will fish them again next year. See, the reason those moments become extraordinary is not because of the people involved, but because his spirit shows up. And I guess this was Jesus' way from the very beginning, and that's why I had this text read today. Let's, uh, let me just read a, a few of these. John says, in, in the beginning was the Word, and we know the Word is Jesus. You know, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and through him... All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Are you hearing how epic that is? In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. A little bit later on, he says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, and he was in the world, and even though the world was made through him, it didn't recognize. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. And then down in verse 14, John says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's so much we could say about this passage. I just want to make a few observations. Jesus, the word, the one through whom everything was made chooses to take on the form of that which he made. He became one of us, and he lived among us. And he wasn't born into power or prestige or position or popularity. Right? I love how John writes it up here. He says, uh, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And even though that entire world was made through him, no one saw him for who he was. Here's what I want to highlight, that Jesus comes into the world in obscurity on purpose. Jesus comes into the world in obscurity on purpose. In, in Paul's letters, he says the same kind of thing, right? He says the same kind of thing, that Jesus, the one that holds all of creation together, the one through and for whom everything was made, that Jesus opts out 
of all the things that kind of authority sort of offers. Paul says Jesus has every right to claim those things, but he gives them up in favor of a different kind of posture. What I mean to say is Jesus had every right to recognition. He should have been welcomed and received and respected everywhere that he went. He should have blinded everyone with the flashbulbs of his ego shot. And yet the true light that gives light to everyone takes a different posture. Paul would call it a servant. That he makes himself nothing. Here in this text, John says Jesus takes on our flesh and lives among us. When we were doing ministry in the city, we would quote this last verse and say that that Jesus took on our form and moved into the neighborhood. There's nothing particularly epic about that. Becoming human and moving in with us. So I began to wonder if I had perhaps been missing something. That if Jesus could enter our world with resurrection, intention, and kingdom purpose, but do so in near total obscurity, if he could live without a thirst for some kind of kingdom hero shot, maybe God was at work and inviting me to participate in his kingdom that is telling his story with my life in the very ordinary places of my life. Maybe God was working in the obscurity that I found myself in. And here's the part that sort of hurt. I wondered if my drive to write an epic story with my life, right, to leave my kingdom mark, to be in the shutter, fr- flame, shutter frame and, and the flash bulb of the hero shot, if that was blinding me to the beautiful story that God was writing in my life. What would happen if I started to pay attention to very ordinary things? If I just moved into the neighborhood, right? Stop trying to be a kingdom rock star. Do a, do that a different way, right? Engage the actual people around me. Take a different posture, one that's much more servant than celebrity. So in the, in the spirit of the ordinary, I did something very ordinary. I had about a 20-minute drive to work, and I just prayed every day, almost like clenching the wheel of the car. Okay, God, help me to pay attention to what you're doing in other people's lives. Help me to pay attention to what you are doing in the lives of the people I encounter today, and help me to care about that more than I care about this mess I think I'm in. And I just put it on repeat, 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 just to like get myself to maybe engage the day differently. And I will say this, it changed everything. I had started praying this prayer for a few days on my way to work. And I'm standing on the middle of a sales floor on a very busy day. And I have a coworker who walks up to me and she says, Adam, my husband came home last night. And he told me that he's leaving me and he wants to divorce me. Middle of the sales floor. He wants to divorce me. And um, as I listened to him talk about why it is he wanted to leave, I came face to face with my own brokenness. Direct quote. I came face to face with my own brokenness and I met with Lex. I had a coworker pull me aside and said, Adam, I notice, I noticed that uh, you don't, you're not critical of your job. You know, you're not negative all the time. I'm like, who, who are you listening to? <laughs> I'm good, glad you missed it. No, he said, I notice you're not critical on the job. You're not you're not negative about it, and you're not, you don't gossip about people. And he goes, I feel like I'm entirely too negative. Would you nicely, if you notice I'm doing that, pull, pull me to the side and have a conversation about it? Somebody that I worked with said, you know, I, I just helped this customer over here, and they said they knew you. And I looked over, and, yeah, I, I know who they were. And they said they knew you. I said, yeah, Adam's kind of like the pastor of our store. When Moses realized that God was there in the burning bush, he takes off his sandals. It's a holy ground moment. I feel like most days I just go barefoot to work just in preparation. Just in preparation. 
nothing about the external particulars of my job has changed at all. Nothing. It is the same job. But I feel like God has given me the grace to see him where I could not see him before. Right? In that very obscure, very ordinary life that I live, I'm bearing witness to the activity of God, and somehow I find myself in the middle of it. It is not the story that I would have written. It is also not the story that I would write right now if I had the information. But I'm learning that my part in what God is doing in the world through Jesus, right, in drawing people to himself and renewing creation through Christ, that's not my story to write. It's his story to submit to. And if I would quit trying so darn hard to write it, and instead of trying to be the hero, submit to the hero, I have found myself at the intersection of God's kingdom and people's lives in a much more profound way than I ever did when I was posing for hero status. I don't get it right all the time. Most days, I'll be honest, most days I still am struggling with that thing by my own junk, right? Too blinded by my own ambition to see the extraordinarily open work of God. So, so here's how I'd want to challenge you today. I'm going to try and be brief here. Here's how I'd want to challenge you today. Uh, you're sitting in a phase of life where you are thinking about, preparing for, and setting a trajectory for the rest of your lives. Right? And as you're doing that, I would say this. Don't forget. Don't forget that the good news of God's kingdom come to us in Jesus takes root and blossoms and will be poured into us. Right? We all want to be people, presumably, who want to be a part of God's kingdom work. Right? We want to be a part of that big story that God is telling in the world through Jesus. And that's an incredible thing that we get to participate in. But please don't confuse the invitation to participate in an epic story with permission to write your own epic story. Because throughout your life, you may or may not have opportunities to pose for your own hero. There's nothing neither good nor bad about that, right? But please don't confuse that for the life of God's kingdom. What I can tell you is this. No matter where you go and what you do, as you follow your passion and as you work out your calling, you will always, always, always have neighbors and neighborhoods. That is, you will always have the, the people that God has placed you among in the place that he's put you. You will always have that. And if you have the eyes to see it, if you have the eyes to see it, that means that you get to live your entire life in the arena of God's activity. That's what I want you to hear today. If you have eyes to see it, you get to live your entire life in the arena of God's activity. The temptation might be to pay very little attention to the ordinary as you pursue extraordinary things. But I would want to encourage you to spend your energy and passion asking God to teach you what it means that God can't use you anywhere but right where you're at. If he can't use you way over there, it's this is where you are. You don't have to go to find where God is at work. You have to learn to see it. Move into the neighborhood wherever that takes you, and learn to see God at work. And that may not be very epic. That may not be, that may not seem very exciting. But I would guess I would just leave you with this thought. As we seek to be people who live out the gospel in the world, that Jesus himself, the true light that gives light to everyone, he moved into the neighborhood. And we have all seen his light shine.